14th stage. We've gone past the unlucky 13th yesterday, which is unlucky for people like Greg LeMond. We'll put you in the picture about that later on. As we now admire the view back down the valley. The riders start this morning just off the slopes of Siesta on this uh, route today of 186 kilometres. And you can see there, it's a very, very rough one in day, indeed. As we're now starting up this climb here of the Col de Lotore. It is just a little pipe opener before they head up then towards the Col de Galibier which is a hope category climb and that is the cracker for today 2640 meters above sea level and in fact all this climb up from the valley uh, they will be traveling some 21 and a half kilometers up and you can see there back down the slope that the crowds have already got up here to wait the arrival of the race and it's right down in the valley this climb up the Col de Galibier then today the uh, first 10.8 kilometers will have a climb of 8% of uh, 5% then toward the top, the last 8.7 kilometres will be a climb of 6.6%. So those are the sort of climbs they've got on the Galibier just ahead of them. And then once they're over the top of the Galibier, we're picking up the leaders at the moment, this little group on the front, and yet again we can see that... Um, uh, the career of riders are starting to have a go. Already this morning, over the first climb of the day, it was um, the rider from uh, the RMO team who went away and took the first of the climbs of the day. So that was just a second category climb that was within uh, the first eight kilometres. Uh, and here then, we're just picking up these little riders who I suspect with uh, Stevens here. I'm sure that uh, my co-commentator today, uh, Clayton, will be... Uh, We'll be very pleased to see uh, Stevens in that little group because I've got Clayton Stevenson who was with me yesterday and he, like I, marvelled at the performance uh, yesterday. But uh, right now, I suppose, Clayton, to see one of your countrymen up there must be giving you some enthusiasm despite the fact that the chase is coming up with Punyo in the lead. Yes, yeah, certainly, um, David. Uh, after yesterday's stage, I'm sure all the, tired, the, the riders are quite tired and to be going this early into the stage. I mean, they've uh, only covered 40 kilometres and you can see the pace is very high at the moment and the groups are starting to split already. Well, I'm sorry, by the way, that when they put up the commentator, they just put a Union Jack up. They don't get the Australian flag for you. We might qualify <laughs> next show with Alan Piper, too, because he often helps me out. See if we can influence the, the coloured flag. Well, there we have uh, uh, Miller going across, Fignon coming up. A very active bunch, indeed, uh, as uh, Ciccoli is on the wheel of uh, Bugno. And look at the way that Fignon comes up to his uh, team leader, because he's riding with the Gatorade team, is Laurent Fignon. And he's up now alongside and taking up the pace. This looks like a challenge we might see developing. First Further back down, I can see the yellow jersey of Indoran, and he looks back down. My goodness, we wondered if yesterday, after that uh, decimation of the field, when the, the riders had a terrible hard day in the saddle, seven hours, 44 minutes and 51 seconds it was for the uh, uh, day's racing yesterday when the stage was won by Claudio Capucci, uh, averaged something like 33 kilometres per hour. They were two kilometres an hour faster than the expected fastest time, and we thought there'd be a, uh, perhaps a lull in the storm today, but not so at all as uh, Clayton here riding on, on that quite a unusual bicycle, isn't that, uh, on C1? Yes, um, that's uh, the, the new model of look um, frame, and I noticed yesterday a lot of, the mo well, most of the riders were riding steel frames. Normally um, the, the teams are supplied with carbon fibre or the very light uh, aluminium type material for the clients, but um, just looking at the front riders yesterday, uh, almost without exception, they were riding the, the conventional steel bikes. Well, one unconventional bike out in front at the moment, and here, uh, unconventional as ever, Laurent Fignon cracking away, trying to pull back that little group up in front. Robert Miller sat in the back. Well, he's uh, no stranger to the Alpe d'Huez. He's had much success there in the past. He's also taken some right pastings, too, on that climb. That's the one that is at the end of the stay today, 186.5 kilometres they've got to cover today. So that's just over 100 miles, about 110 miles in all, and uh, the riders yesterday on that long, long stage, 7 hours, 44 minutes. The previous day uh, when they were racing, and they also had a tough day the day before, and we thought that would knock the stuffing out of them, they were also in the saddle about 7 and a quarter hours. So if you add those two together, the top men had something like about 15 hours in the saddle in two uh, days racing. But some of them came in a long, long way down. 
And if your Sunday paper has not already reported it, let me tell you that uh, there were 15, uh, 14 riders abandoned yesterday, including Adrie van der Poel, Remy Stumpf, Steve Bowers out because he had uh, tummy trouble during and after the time trial. Laurent Dufo, the young uh, Swiss rider, decided enough was enough. And of course, Iniki Gaston, who crashed, was also eliminated yesterday. And outside the time limit, unfortunately, Jabberin Abdul Japarov, we're not going to see him charging down the uh, finishing line at the Champs Elysees in uh, a week's time. Sunday week, it all finishes, but still a lot of racing ahead of them. And look at those wonderful peaks. As far as we're concerned, sitting here, you at home watching the view, you think, isn't that marvellous? Well, the blokes down on the road are on that uh, inferno trail up towards the top of the Galibier. Peter Meinhardt uh, was outside the time limit yesterday. Malo Gionetti outside the time limit yesterday as well. 14 men then abandoned. Van Hoendunk didn't start. So right now we're down to this morning 148 riders. Uh, yesterday were the number that finished the stage. And uh, Greg Lamond just got inside the time limit. He finished 49 minutes and 38 seconds down on the winner, Claudio Chiapucci, who did a marvellous ride on his own, one of the best we've ever seen. And now look at this, they've come up straight through as well. Is this the onslaught we're going to expect? Bunyo, who has in the past uh, two years consecutively won the stage up the Alpe d'Huez, but on this climb now, they're somewhere around about the uh, 46 kilometre mark, or coming up towards the 46 kilometre mark. Today, then 186 kilometres. They've still got another 140 kilometres to go. That's around about uh, 80 odd miles. So Bunyo has gone on a very, very early attack here, and that is quite a surprise. Bunyo lying at the moment on general classification third overall, he's four minutes 20 seconds down on Miguel Indoran, who has the yellow jersey Claudio Capucci is in second place on general classification one minute 42 seconds down, and we're looking at Robert Miller, who is in 15th place overall, 17, 26 down and also in that little breakaway group at the moment Laurent Fignon, who is 10 minutes and 11 seconds down in seventh spot so there's some very, very good, strong riders in this little group at the moment and I don't think this bunch behind are going to let them get too far, Jean-Francois Bernard burning up the tarmac on the front here and the gap now 22 seconds this is a cracking race already and we're only some 40 odd seconds 40 odd kilometers into the race well Clayton we were talking about this this morning weren't we to so, well, they might take an easy day but I mean he looks like he's riding smoothly enough um, well certainly you can see the the break that's up the road there's uh, Bunio and Fignon from the from the same team and obviously Bunio is trying to get time and put the pressure on Indiran which you can see here with his two teammates, Delgado and Bernard. Both uh, 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 Delgado is a previous Tour de France winner and uh, Jeff Francois Bernard is a previous stage winner. I mean, they're both brilliant riders and here they are riding for Indiran. And uh, it's getting quite desperate. You can see the bunches strung out there and there's a lot of riders that are suffering. You can see there's, they're, they're moving around on their bikes and, uh, and they're... <laughs> They're very, there's a lot that seem very uh, uncomfortable there. So the, 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 the pace is uh, very quick, very early in, the, in this stage. And the uh, riders then, Gerospi, we're just looking at at the moment. Fabrice Filippo is out of the race, by the way, as far as Bonesso is concerned. They've lost one of their uh, men, so that's going to thin it down somewhat. Uh, Jean-Francois Bernard, a rider who started the season in fine form by winning the, the Paris-Nice. And that final time trial we had up the mountain uh, at the finish of the race had to be seen to be believed. He came back with a bang. A lot of people had written off Jean-Francois Bernard, who's had more than his fair share of troubles over the years. But here he is riding his heart out on behalf of... Uh, in the rain. This is some chase. Absolutely tremendous. And still the two riders on the front then for the Vanesto team and now then, we haven't really seen a lot of uh, Bunyo. He tried to attack yesterday, uh, and he was marked immediately by Indurain, and now they've allowed him to get away a little bit at the front, uh, also helping taking up the... Uh, um the work on the front here then, Ciccoli, who has got his back towards Italy, previous winner of the uh, Tour of Italy. A very, very accomplished mountain climber indeed. See the number on, the, on his bike there, one. That shows he is a team leader on his uh, Bianchi bike, 191. 11 here, legs 11, shows that uh, Bugno is the number one for the uh, Gatorade team. And then coming up behind, Robert Miller bouncing out the saddle. Neil Stevens looking good as well. Robin with it, and uh, Laurent Fignon. So... 
What a, oh, Neil's having a go, isn't he? He's been right. around for a long time. I remember him what, riding for ANC. It must have been about seven years ago. He's a long-standing pro, isn't he? Yes, well, uh, Neil Neil called me a little while ago before the tour started, and uh, he's he's ridden the Tour of Spain, the Tour of Italy, and now the Tour de France, which uh, to ride all three of the big tours of three weeks apiece in one season is quite a, an achievement for a rider. So... He was uh, looking forward to riding the tour, and certainly uh, yesterday we saw a lot of his jersey on the front, and today, now, again, he's in the break. Uh, let's look what the gap is then. 27 seconds on the, uh, the climb up towards the top of the uh, Galibier. That's uh, still in sight of uh, this field behind, but you can see the pressure is on. A lot of riders. Uh, Neil's team, though, isn't too strong. They're not, uh, at the moment, seeing to get up there. I don't see many pink jerseys. No, uh, we, we didn't really see a lot of um, the on-site team yesterday, but, uh, I mean, Neil's, uh, Neil would be looking at being in a break himself and trying to do well in the stage, and he's, he's there and he's got his teammates back in the group who, if they're caught, so he's uh, just taking his chance and he's in with uh, some good riders, and certainly this, this break's looking very dangerous. You can see... It's, uh, it's, it's early in the stage and it's, uh, it's become a lot more desperate than it was yesterday. Yesterday, as we watched the race, it unfolded quite uh, steadily and until the, the last sort of 20 kilometres, they started driving on the last climb. But you can see here now that they're looking round and uh, they're, they're certainly not as, um, as steady as they were yesterday. Well, Miller has, has been getting better all the way through this tour. I've been watching him. He's always been there or thereabouts. And I've never felt that Miller, he probably told me to mind my own business, was actually busting a gut. And I think he wants to win a stage. And this one today being a little bit shorter, in fact, a lot shorter than yesterday, um, something like about 70 kilometres shorter. Uh, and you can see there the, the, the mountainside where in the, in, the, in the winter the snow comes pouring down off the top of that mountain. They get avalanches and all sorts of problems. In fact, the Galibier uh, during the winter often gets closed by by the terrible conditions they get up there. And they're heading up towards the top of this uh, mountain, which has been used on the Tour de France uh, ever since way back in 1911, when they first went over it. 1903, the Tour de France started, first of all. And now we're going up this uh, very, very famous mountain then, up the top of the Galibier. And uh, let's see if these riders here can stay away, because once they're over the top of that one, there's an enormous drop down to the 103 kilometer point. So they've got something like about 50 kilometers downhill. They're hanging on for grim death we're going to take a short break so do come back to us in a couple of moments time to see if they can stay away to the top and as you join us then this uh, main group of riders well spread down the road you can see in the distance the uh, the cars a nice shot from a helicopter's dropping down level with the uh, road because there are some uh, wonderful sights we can pick up off the helicopter with no problems about power lines and houses and what have you and this is a magnificent scene just look at those uh, uh, ca capped uh, mountains in the back there with the snow all over them the riders here in the cool of the tunnels and in fact yesterday when Claudio Chiapucci attacked he had been accused very often by Indrain and one or two other of the riders of attacking in a tunnel because he likes to do the unusual and they complained about him attacking in a tunnel so yesterday when he took off uh, after 14 kilometres had been covered he actually attacked Chiapucci right in the daylight right out where everybody could see him and I won't say exactly turn around and show him he was off but he he really took off yesterday at the 14 kilometer point and they all saw him go and like being in a tunnel like that one which is it's especially built by the way so that the uh, the snow can come down off the top of the mountains and not to uh, block the road so Tadek Kipuchi took off yesterday uh, completely inside of everybody else he had a group of uh, some nine men with him to begin with at uh, 14 kilometers by the time he got to Cestas uh, some 240 kilometers later uh, that's something like 150 odd miles on his own. Uh, he was still on his own and he won the stage. So that was a daylight sortie as far as he was concerned, right under the noses of the top riders. Well, he's just back there still, Benesto uh, trying, but they seem to have lost a bit of rhythm at the moment. Yes, um, the, you can see the, the riders there, they're, they're really putting in and they, they had to ride quite hard yesterday as well. And uh, this this move by Bunyo and Fignon in the in the front group is, is very smart because what they're doing is putting pressure on the the domestics of Indiram, which is uh, trying to break down his little army that he has. Well, he's a bit weaker this year as well as regards uh, support in Indiram because uh, one of the key men that was riding with him last year has. Uh, 
gone off and joined the Gatorade team. I'm referring to uh, Abelardo Rondon, who rides number 16, who's just, in fact, sitting towards the back of the main Bonesto group there. Very strong and dedicated team man he is indeed, but now he's riding with the Chateau Dax team. There you can see Fignon in the green and black colours. Those are the colours of Chateau Dax. And here, their team leader, Bunyo, looking remarkably cool, calm and collected. But yesterday, uh, he did look in an awful state. See where the race is going, all the way up that... Um, up that to climb in the distance. So here the Col de Lotere, 46 and a half kilometres in to the race. And Neil looks quite comfortable in the pink. Yes, he's got his shirt undone and um, he's put his, just put his glasses up um, on top of his head. He, he's, he could be perspiring a bit too much uh, into, into his glasses. But you can see the, the Castorama rider there, Jean Cyril Robin. Uh, he's only 22 years old and he's leading the French point score at the moment. He's uh, one of Cyril Goumard's boys and he's really, he's a second year professional and he's really uh, made the transition into the bunch here and you can see he's riding very smoothly. So the uh, group still getting away at the moment. Having a quick look at Neil Stevens. he, uh, it, it 10th, 1st of August uh, 19... Uh, 63. So he's coming up towards his 29th birthday at the moment. So, and he's been around quite a long time. He must have been riding as a pro in England when he was only about 22 then, I suppose. No, uh, well, eh? actually, Neil turned professional in Australia at the age of 17 ah. and uh, made his retirement at 19. So he's on his, <laughs> his second wind at the moment, a decade later. Well, he, he came across to England. I remember him turning up this young Aussie. And uh, there was a little team called ANC. There was one fellow, Mickey Morrison, was riding with them. He's, he was the only single sponsored rider. Mickey who came from Stoke-on-Trent had found ANC, which is a, 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 a carrying company, that one of these sort of large vehicles you run up and down the motorways carrying goods and, and parcels for people. Well, they're splitting here. Sheer well, Coley going away, isn't it? That's uh, quite a turn up for the books. I know he wants to try and get the Col de Galibier, which has got a wonderful history as far as the Italians are concerned, but um, nevertheless, the rest can't hold his wheel at the moment, can they? No, well, he, he looked to be uh, working in with Bunyo, even though they're from different teams. I, I don't know, they looked to be working together before, but obviously now he's gone ahead a bit, and uh, it's, it's Bunyo that sort of takes up the chase and is riding tempo on the front of the group at the moment. And young Robin uh, coming off the back of that one. I was talking about the ANC, well, that, that was interesting, because first of all, uh, this uh, Mickey Morrison got the sponsor and had found him uh, in... Uh, in Stoke-on-Trent, and then uh, Neil Stevens joined the team. There were just two of them, and this young Neil, we never knew who the hell he was. He turned up to ride in this, this team, and he started riding some of the city centre races. Uh, and I explained, actually, before he joined me, Clayton, and uh, Cardiff, he went down with a bang, and the shower sparks appeared on British telly for sort of weeks afterwards. Uh, and uh, he disappeared. We didn't know what happened to him. Now you put me in the picture, Richard, and came back again. And ANC, of course, went on from strength to strength, and that small beginning, uh, acorns, uh, do large oak trees grow because the ANC team eventually rode in the Tour de France when people like uh, Malcolm Elliott and uh, Adrian Timmis were the only two to finish the first year they rode. It started in Berlin. It was so fast on the flat to begin with, nobody could sniff the front. And in fact, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, young Sutton was in, well, not young, he'd been old in by then, uh, too. Shane Sutton was in the team. But um, that was a, a British team, the first British trade team to ride in the uh, Tour de France uh, for many, many years. We had to go back to the old uh, Hercules days when, in fact, they were usually split teams rather than one single team that were riding. And so ANC, with Halfords and Lycra supporting them, rode in the Tour. And young Neil Stevens had been one of the early founders of that team. There's a bit of background history information for you while this race is going on. They certainly are climbing quickly. Yes, um, the, you can see there the, the motorbike with the information board. That, that's quite helpful to the, the teams chasing because it allows them to know which riders are in the front and, it, uh, and which riders uh, have got the time. I mean, it's very easy to, for us to sit here and watch the monitors and, and for everyone to sit at home and, and know you've got the advantage of, uh, of seeing everything on the, with the motorbike cameras. But the riders in the group, they rely on these information boards to, to understand what's happening in the race and, and uh, also from their director sporters to come up in the car and supply them with information. And a beautiful, stylish rider here, winner of the Tour of Italy uh, last year. Uh, the man who's tipped very much as the new copy, he even has that sort of similar style. He rocks his body a bit more. There's a lovely picture in uh, the book we have at the, all the Tour de France. They equip you with so many books, you can virtually start a library when you get home with information about the race itself and the past history and so on. Magnificent picture in sepia uh, on the pages yesterday of Fausto Coppi heading up towards the uh, victory in Siesta.
and he had that very similar sort of style as uh, the Marley we've just been seeing on our screen, but he used to ride a bit more rock steady than that. He was, that fellow was just pushing a bit hard. I'm not surprised because the heat is belting down yet. Yesterday, well over 30 degrees, that's 80-something uh, plus. And there we are, Kia Pucci then, 318 points. Verong 167, you can read all that down for yourself. But you see what Ciccoli's going to try and do now. He's got a chance of moving up second on the King of the Mountains. And that confirms the first climb of the day when uh, Veronk went up over the top. They're all pretty well bunched together. Ekimov was driving hard because at the first sprint of the day for the uh, EEC little sticker. If um, you ever get a chance of looking at Ekimov on the podium at the end of the uh, tours, any of the stage in the tour, you'll find he's got a little blue sticker up on his jersey. That's because he's leading in the special sprints we've been having as they've gone across from one country to another. And the one at uh, Montenegro this morning was won by Yekimov. So, as to the best of my knowledge, we haven't got any more of those uh, EEC sprints because we've gone across all the borders of all the, uh, the countries now. It looks like Yekimov's won that very special uh, event in this year's Tour de France and will have at least something to show for his pains and suffering in the race so far. Well, the man determined, I think, to get to the top of the Col de Galibier, 2,640 metres above sea level. Is this man we're watching now? To the bottom of the uh, mountain, to the top, 21 and a half kilometres in all to be covered, but he's had two little bursts on the banjo. The, the first 10.8 kilometres, a 5% climb, and now he's on the tough bit towards the top, the final 8.7 kilometres of 6.6%, and the, uh, the neutral service vehicle's dropping in behind him, so it looks like he's getting something like 30 seconds on him. Yes, um, I think... I think the riders at the moment, they're, they're not too worried about the group out in, um, about the, the Italian out in front. They're, I mean, they're more or less worried about the, the group behind. They're trying to keep their distance. And um, for Fignon, you can see him in riding on the front again for Bugno. And, and they want to get over this climb and get down this descent. I mean, it's going to be a very quick descent. You're looking at uh, a straight 20 kilometres and it's uh, quite a steep gradient and it uh, levels out and, and climbs up a bit. And, I mean, they're virtually with with uh, the, the little little section in the middle of the descent that climbs up. I mean, they, they've virtually got 47 kilometres of descending, so they want to get over, over the top and get down this. And the man at the back struggling to stay in contention, Greg LeMond. We saw the result of the first climb of the day. I told you about the sprint after some eight kilometres, but as they climbed up uh, Mont uh, Genevre, Greg LeMond had difficulty again in hanging on, and he's off the back now. As we're looking at Ciccoli, 22nd at 22.31 on general classification. So he is no great threat to the yellow jersey, but certainly he wants to get up here. There's a special prize, by the way, at the top of the climb here in memory of Henri de Grange, and this man is on his way to try and get it. Come back and see if he does do just that. And uh, Ciccoli still in the lead then, ahead of this group, heading up towards the top of uh, the uh, Col de Galibier. Miller on the back now, one or two of the early hopefuls hanging on for grim death. And look at the riders behind being split off what's left of the main group of riders. Probably only something like 140 in contention really this morning when they said, oh, I think 148 was the actual start number. Having a quick look at the old notes here. And now there can't be many more than about uh, 90 or 100 or so in that a bunch and the yellow jersey just back then in uh, third spot with his Bonesto teammates round about him but up in front uh, 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 Ciccoli on his way to collect some maximum points well I think Kiapucci in this field this is a great ride yesterday and he's got so many points in the King of the Mountains competition that he can afford I use the word a day off then he can certainly sit in now and wait and see if Indurain is going to crack well everybody in the uh, tour oh look at the name there Arlemo and Limo actually cut in the grass. How about that? A bit of advertising, eh? Oh, there. Well, <laughs> I have to say, well, well, Clayton rides for the RMO, eh? Did you do that? <laughs> no, certainly not, no. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I suppose by next year it'll all grown over. Mind you, we don't come over the uh, Galibier every year. We haven't been over it since 1989 when Tunisia went across. A couple of years before that, it was Munoz. Uh, and in 1986, Herrera won the climb, Rodriguez in 84. And we can look back the roll call of honour of riders who've gone over the top of the Galibier in first place since uh, Georges went over in 1911, including 
great names like Bahamontes and Charlie Golf, Hausto Kapi, of course, Eddie Merckx and uh, Zatomo Okana. All the great names over the years have uh, gone up the top of this one and carved their name in the history book. So a little Robin seems to have uh, decided enough is enough. Uh, Miller at the back sitting in quite comfortably here. I don't think they're going to see their way up through and collect that prize at the top. Robert Miller looking stronger than I've seen him for some years in the Tour de France. He finished fourth in 84. He's taken the King of the Mountains jersey in the past as well. We've got to look back as far as uh, 1989 when he had a stage win. Uh, Robert finishing 10th overall. And uh, now he's in this little group here. Pretty certain, I'm sure, to be thinking of an opportunity of winning the stage up the Alpe d'Huez. But uh, a man with equal intention is uh, back in the main group. That's uh, Gert Jan Tunisa. Because I can tell you, camping out for the last couple of days, there have been halls of Dutchmen, and the Alpe d'Huez have been closed since 9 o'clock this morning for people trying to get up the uh, climb. They've either got to walk it or ride their bikes up and try and find a vantage point, because it's absolutely seething with people who are watching on their television sets this uh, broadcast of uh, the race. All the portal tellers there, masses of people round about with their picnics going full bore, because this is the first time in the tour, this uh, stage today and the stage yesterday, when we see virtually all the stage on television. Normally we've only got the last uh, hour and a half or maybe the most two hours of coverage on television and sometimes we've had maybe half an hour, an hour in the morning, a little bit of gap and come back again and they've used uh, across the mountains special ways of beaming the pictures from peak to peak to get them into the uh, main transmission place but right now uh, 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 nice shot down the, back down the, down the slope, uh, Cameron wanting to to uh, get a picture, and I think he might have wanted to get Hino in there. I, I think Hino was in that particular car to make a sort of classic shot of it. But now with satellites, the old picture can get boomed straight up into the sky, and uh, we're getting a lot of modern technology coming along, which is giving you all your people at home an opportunity of seeing what the race is all about. We don't normally get to cover these parts of the race. We may just get a camera on top of the Galibier, pick a bit of it up from a couple of static cameras in the old days, and maybe one or two shooting down the slopes, but you wouldn't get the whole story whatsoever. And uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, Clayton, are you sort of wishing in your heart you were out there with this lot, despite all the suffering? Um, no, well, I, I mean, I'm pretty thrilled at the moment. Neil Stevens, a, a sort of fellow countryman, but also a very, very good friend of mine. I can see uh, he's, he's progressed over the last few years and uh, he's overcome a lot of difficulty and a lot of uh, physical problems to, to be where he is today. And, I mean, he's in Once, which is the, the one of the biggest Spanish teams. And here he is in, in the break in the Tour de France. And I think it's terrific for, for him. How does he get to ride an Australian for a Spanish team? I know you ride for a French team, RMO. I mean, how do they get sort of switched from team to team? Or is you get little encampments of Aussies in certain teams? Because uh, there's at least another one in his team, isn't there? Yes. He's got um, a Hodge with him, hasn't he? Yes, he's got Stephen Hodge, and they've also got the Welts brothers from Denmark in the Onsei team. Um, it, it just happened that uh, last year uh, at the World Championships, Neil put in a, a tremendous ride, and, uh, and the Onsei team was sort of uh, aware of him through through Stephen Hodge, and here he is today with the with the Onsei team. And another trem tremendous ride that we're talking about, uh, uh, the young riders uh, in the race, and Hodge in particular, and Stevens. We were looking then in the gap at 30 seconds at the work that Phenom was doing on the front. So we get these new riders coming through, rubbing shoulders with the giants of the road. Phenom it is, that's taking Bunyu up, because whilst Chircoli has given him the split uh, on this uh, climb of the Galibier, Miller's doing the right thing, I think, in sitting in just behind, up towards the top of this climb, that uh, special prize, the souvenir on the Degrange, is up the top of the Col de Galibier. Up there, there was a special prize of 20,000 uh, French francs for the first rider over the top. That's about just in excess of 2,000 pounds in English money. And that's a prize for the first one. The second one will still get 10,000 French francs. That, again, is about 1,000 pounds. And well on his way to taking this one is uh, the rider from Italy riding for the GB. MG boys and the field behind them is not quite so spread out as we had before. No, they seem to have come back together again. Uh, but if you look just behind this group, if you can look a bit further back, there's a lot of uh, riders struggling and already further back you're going to have your, uh, your, 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 your bus or your, your back group and they're going to be just riding steady up the climb and they know they've got a long day ahead of them they, and they just want to survive today. Well, they survived yesterday, the back group, the bus, I'm pretty sure it was Duca La Salle that was the, uh, was the bus driver or the ticket collector because he came in 124, 49, 38 down, 
the whole crowd of riders came in just round about uh, 50 minutes down on the uh, on the winner yesterday, and I would think someone like Duke Arcel, who's got this to a fine art now, was probably one of the lads who had worked out just what it was to uh, get to the finish. Here we are, they're nearly towards the top of the Col de Galibier. What happened yesterday, the stage winning time was 7 hours 44 minutes and 51 seconds, and they have a sliding scale of percentages uh, for the, uh, the the winner's time and what uh, will be the cut-off point for the, the late uh, arrivals. And yesterday it was 13%. The maximum was 15% for uh, 31 uh, kilometres per hour average speed. Well, they did 33, in fact, and so it was a 13% uh, elimination yesterday on the time. And those riders who came in just inside 55 minutes were all allowed in the race, and a whole bunch of them did just that by the skin of their teeth, except to be like Abdul Japrov and Meinhardt who uh, were outside it and uh, a load of other boys who abandoned as well. Well, on his way up toward the top setting a tremendous pace uh, is this rider here, uh, Ciccoli. And when they get toward the top, you can see it's one of these gentle long climbs. People say to me, well, what are these climbs like to ride? I mean, in England, we get short, sharp little stinking hills. We get several of them, one on top of each other. But, you know, it must be real pressure to, to go on up like this all the way. Um, it's not only physical and uh, sort of a mental pressure. They can actually see the road ahead, which makes it difficult. Um, you've got the temperature. You've got the temperature uh, rising. And at that altitude, I mean, you're looking at, you're looking at around, they're, they're getting around the 2,200 metre mark and they'll be going to 2,640 metres. And certainly the breathing will become more difficult and as the air gets thinner, it's, uh, there's less oxygen in the air and they're going to have to work a lot harder. And breathing very deeply indeed uh, to get the, that oxygen into the lung because the body uh, needs that uh, fresh uh, air going into the lungs for the heart to pump around the, the blood and the uh, heartbeats now must be tremendous to get the strength back in. Because what's happening is that the, the, the starches in the body are being used up and burnt into sugar to provide energy and that uh, that's going on inside your body and you have to breathe more and more to get more and more energy and effort. And look at the way it's split. You're quite right, they're, they're sliding off the back now. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. There can't be more than the, about 45, the maximum 50 riders in what's left of the main field. And we're only on the first big climb of the day. We came over a second category one just after eight kilometres from the start when Greg LeMond uh, suddenly discovered he left his legs in the hotel bedroom and he was off the back. And now we're getting towards the top of the uh, Col de Galibier with some 55 kilometres covered when they get up there. A long sweep down the other side. Again, about 50 kilometres meters to the bottom and that as uh, Clayton was saying is nearly all downhill a little bit of a, a going up a bit uh, for only just a sort of a, a couple of uh, kilometers or so so at least they'll, they'll be having some relief but then we go up towards the uh, Cro Col de la uh, Croix de Fer and that will come after 132 kilometers have been covered so that's um, around about 80 odd miles of the race down the other side in fact there's no rest for the wicket today you're either going up or you're going down <laughs> the uh, the shape of the course is absolutely phenomenal today. There's a little bit of a, a flattish run in towards uh, Bourg d'Azoir, but that's only for probably somewhere around about uh, eight or nine kilometres, but pretty well all day today, they're going to be either up or down. The, uh, this second climb, the, the Croix de Feur, um, in, uh, that, that's a, a, French, a French name, and the, the translation for that is the Cross of the Fire, so... Uh, Maybe that's a sign of things to come today, David. Well, I've been over there when it wasn't a cross of fire. We were on, on the, uh, uh, the Monte Carlo rally I was mentioning yesterday. Uh, actually, when it was, again, so snowy, there were about sort of six and eight foot banks of snow on the top, and we all got stuck in the snow, and the, the car I was with had to be pulled out of, the, out of the ditch when we slid down, and it was so damn cold up there. All the inside the windows were freezing up and everything. But what a difference today. 80-plus degrees uh, in English Fahrenheit and 30-something uh, in centigrade and the sun bouncing off the rocks in this rarefied atmosphere Robert Miller is in his element good to see him back in such fine form the bowl Robert who is doing I think the right thing and sitting in there looking ever so calm and collected and what a character he is I was saying yesterday too writing in cycling the weekly magazine some of his, his thoughts and you might remember the the problems with the big trucks that were blocking all the roads well actually Robert was in sympathy with them I noticed in last week's copy of cycling because he said 
Well, he's, I wouldn't like to have this new point system. He said, I go across two red lights on my bike and I lose my driving license. Well, even I didn't know that was the, uh, the, the, the law. I didn't think they were going to get bike rail. Well, perhaps it was uh, his subtle sense of humour because uh, Robert now is developing into quite a dry sense of humour. For years, he wouldn't speak to the press, but now as he's getting older, he's getting more uh, generous with his uh, comments to uh, the press, and I can tell you he's got a very, very dry sense of humour indeed. You need a sense of humour this game, game, don't you, Clayton? That's for sure. Robert, um, Robert's one of the, the few vegetarians in the bunch, and he, uh, the, the, the French pride themselves on seeing how much uh, red meat they can eat, and, and Robert's always laughing at them, telling, uh, telling them that he can survive on just bread alone. So, and he, he literally does survive on bread alone. Well, another man who was vegetarian, Alan Piper, actually in the Tour of Italy, he was uh, uh, he went on 159km break and he nearly uh, won the stage and he got caught. And then he got awarded a special prize of £250 worth of salami, of all things. And he's vegetarian as well. I don't know what he's done with it. Salami sandwiches for the team for the next two years, I suppose. 125, that's, that's really opened up, hasn't it? It was just uh, around about 20 seconds that we started the, at the bottom of the climb, and uh, Chicoli 125 ahead on the uh, climb up toward the top, and he's nearly there. We'll have the old clock going when they go over the top, already out of uh, sight of these riders. So Chicoli, it looks like Miller's stretching his legs a bit. This, uh, this small group, you can see the sign just back there. Um sponsored by Coca-Cola Light, the, the king of the mountains, and they've got one kilometre to the summit, and then they're going to be um, similar to yesterday. They'll be zipping up their shirts and jackets and uh, going going flat out on the descent. The camper vans in profusion. People have been stopping here all night. Actually, if you look up on the mountainsides in the evening, uh, you'll see all the lights on of the caravans and the little uh, fires they're having up there. They're cooking their, their food in the evening. And uh, here we see the rider just getting up towards the top of this very, very famous climb then, following in the wheel marks of uh, people like Fausto Cobb and looking down to see who was the last uh, Italian to go over the top here. Uh, since, in fact, Fausto Cobb 52, which is some 40 years ago, I can't see another one that's actually got over the top here uh, in first place, so that's going to be something the Italians will be very pleased to see, because he's not going to get headed now. The, the crowd applauding him on the way up. The last few uh, zigzags, the hairpin bends, as uh, the photographers on the side of the road get their pictures of the records of this great performance of a classy rider indeed, who probably since he uh, won his Tour of Italy last year has gone on doing good performances, but been looking for something like this from him in this tour so far without success, but he certainly today said, that one's going to be mine, and all these spectators, we're not far from the Italian border, we came out of Sestri, we sort of freewheeled down the mountain this morning, and then here we are, so close to the border, 55 kilometres of the race have been covered, of the total 185 that's got to be covered uh, so far today. They're down up the top of this climb, that's around about 35 miles of racing so far, and the ups and Miller's come off! Miller's come off and Bunyo. Oh, what a disaster. Well, we didn't uh, see that, uh, what happened. It's so easy to touch a wheel when you put the normal there's a gap between. I hope none of the spectators, what they often do, they stand out on the corners to see what's happening. And uh, it's not unknown for spectators to leap out and not realize there's another rider tucked in coming around the corner. Let's hope it wasn't a spectator. And if, uh, in any case, whatever the reason was, that uh, they have uh, not come to any damage at all, because that'll be a great disappointment if Robert and uh, Bunyo have in any way suffered as they fell. But uh, they're going somewhere around about. Uh, 12, 14 miles an hour at the moment, so in one hour, 43 minutes of racing, Ciccoli takes the uh, uh, the trophy to Arnie de Grange, and uh, the rest of the field closing up, I think, on the escapers. We might see a regroupment on the way down. What a disappointment. Yes, well, we saw yesterday um, at, the, at the finish, in the last two kilometres, the crowd were, were closing in on the riders, and we saw at one point Giapucci was actually stopped. He had to go round the motorbike. And when the police can't control the crowds, I mean, no one can. And for the, the crowd to be stopping the, the hero, I mean, that's, that's really uh, not good for the sport. Well, um, I 
have been thinking since that yesterday, uh, Clayton, that I, somehow they, I, they can't r uh, rope the whole of the area down. They can't put barriers up on the whole of the route down. But I was just wondering in some of these big climbs, well, they might have to start putting cones out and ropes in some way with the gendarmes in front of them or painting a line so the gendarmes can spot who steps forward and try and apprehend them. Because when there's no line, when there's no, say, curb to stand on, when there's nowhere for people to know where they're supposed to stand, they all try and get a better view. And one goes past another one, and you get this little funnel effect. Everybody tries to get a better view. A little lad here on his father's shoulder has got a first class view. But look, they're all edging forward, and in the end, everybody suddenly discovers they've got bike riders on their toes. I mean, we, we saw at the English Grand Prix last week uh, the spectators running onto the track with Nigel Mansell. Uh, here we can see uh, we can see G. Pucci um, driving on the front over the climb, getting ready for the descent. I mean, they're all in uh, all the, the top riders now are in a good position for the descent. So Ciccoli over the top in first spot, that uh, misadventure for uh, the followers because Fignon had to drop back then for Bunyo. They, they have certainly lost a bit of their rhythm. Uh, Miller, uh, fortunately, also brought down when he, when he touched the wheel or touched the spectator. Uh, 127 is considerable, and let's see how Ciccoli drops down here, picking up some of the other riders there, on the way. There, there we can see Christophe Mann and, uh, and Thierry Laurent. Uh, Thierry Laurent had most of the season, early season off. He broke a bone in his foot um, out training, which is unfortunate. Well, there we can see Thierry Claviole uh, there, just at the bottom of the screen, just passing in the Z colours. There's Ronan Penzek. And uh, uh, he's really taken it, hasn't Jeff Jean-François Bernard is struggling now. He was, he was trying to help uh, on the top of the, on the further down the climb, but he's gone now, hasn't he? Yes. Well, that really has sorted them out. This time there's still more riders coming up here. They'll be coming over the top, I think, ending up to 10 minutes. Even Broeking has been seen off now. He was going quite well yesterday. And uh, so... Well, that really has sorted them out. This time there's still more riders coming up here. They'll be coming over the top, I think, ending up to 10 minutes. Even Broeking has been seen off now. He was going quite well yesterday. And uh, so we... You can, you can see uh, Muller there and Fondriest at the back also. So this a group trying to rejoin. We're going to take a short break. Come back to us in just a moment. And still the riders climbing up the Col de Galibier, following behind a Ciccoli who's taken that uh, very special prize. You can see there the gap that's opened up. Little groups of riders waiting to... Uh, Join in the chase down the hill. Back at the, uh, at the pack there for the, the Meyer team, just zipping up uh, his jacket. We had a quick look at the uh, Danish rider, Per Pedersen. And uh, it seems that the Onse team, having worked hard for the green jersey for uh, Laurent Jalabert, are now paying for their efforts. And also in the days when they had De Zula early on in the yellow jersey, they really are drifting off the back now. Um, yes, I mean, teams have good years and bad years, and last year they, they seem to be winning everything, and maybe this year they've gone off a little bit, but, I mean, it's it's like any team, they have their ups and downs. Well, of course, they're without uh, Marina Lejaleta, who crashed badly in the uh, early part of the year, so badly that he's out, in fact, for three years on the trot. He rode the Tour of Spain, Tour of Italy, and the Tour de France. We're mentioning that uh, Stephen Hodge has done that. Well, Anse seem to breed men of that ability because Lejaleta did it. Uh, Mauri, who won the uh, Tour of Spain a uh, year ago, was also uh, struggling uh, to find his form this year. So some of their riders are not going quite as well as they used to do. Perhaps they've been put under too much pressure in previous years and they're needing a bit of time to get back. Oh, look at the pain and suffering. Well, it's interesting. You, um, you look at different sports and you look at the number of times each, each competitor races in, a, in, in any one year. And then there we going see back the crash. Yep. Yes. Yep. We don't see the reason for it, though, do we? We just see spectators no. helping uh, put uh, Bunio back on. Anyway, now, we've got another view from this side here. Well, Miller's foot's out of the pedal, but we can't see again as to why that happened. Um, well, certainly, at that speed, it's not, a, not really a dangerous thing. I mean, they've just hit the ground, and obviously, they've got to get back on their bike as quickly as possible. And uh, fortunately for Robert there, he had the spectator just to be able to hold his seat and just to be pushing him so he can get that gear ticking over again. Well, on the right-hand corner of the screen then, uh, we had a shot of one of these triangular uh, road traffic signs which showed rocks falling off the side of the mountain. I suppose someone would come along and draw a cyclist falling off the side the way that Miller and Bunyo went down again.
But uh, Soren Yates, I can see him there in the British uh, Championship. Joe. These are the heavy men, very often the big, strong chaps who are looking for the honours in the uh, sprinting on the flat. But uh, they begin to struggle a bit. I'm looking down there, some tulip Joe. Where's my friend Alan Piper got to? Is that him? One, two, three, four, four back from the front. Wait till we get a better picture. There's Yates anyway in the white jersey yes, with there. the uh, uh, red, white and blue band around him. Uh, and uh, so Yates is still there. Not a bad climb, but he wouldn't expect to be up with the mountain goats, would he? Denise there from uh, Motorola as well. And it looks like uh, De La Cuevas on the left-hand side, Bernesto. Also, he is really uh, struggling, isn't he? Also eh? Brian Holm yeah, went and through uh, there. Yeah, and here, likewise, for Helvetia, a stageman already in this, this tour. He is really beginning to take some uh, pain and suffering, isn't he? <laughs> One or two of these big runners here we've seen earlier on are beginning to pay for their earlier efforts. Just shows you the state they're in, because... Uh, is that Rui going through as well? Um, that looks like Marie. Yeah, right, as he was Marie. And uh, so Terry Marie who tried to win the opening prologue and got pushed down to third place, but it was a surprise for him. Well, my clock shows that uh, they're still on the way up the climb, and it's seven minutes and 40-odd seconds have gone since the leader went over the top, and look at him gasping for air. And the crowd applauding the valiant efforts of these riders. They know that they are having a job to do to protect their teammates on the flat on the early part. We Looks like a policeman standing point duty on the very top of there. I think he's probably sensible because anybody gets up, this is where they can kick stones down onto the road. So I think he's been sent up there to sentry duty. And here we go again. Well, a motorcyclist on the left-hand side there was right up behind Rod, uh, Robert. I wonder if he touched his wheel or whether he came to hold after. Now he's come to hold afterwards. Quite, quite often on the, the hairpin type bends like that, the riders do bunch up very close. And when a rider gets out of the seat like that, their bike tends to move backwards. So maybe uh, Bunyo's back wheel moved onto to Miller's front wheel and just touched. I mean, it's only a matter of centimetres. And, and once you touch, you, you're sure that you're going to come down. And. Uh so with Panasonic suffering here, well, Panasonic won the uh, team time trial in fine style. They're better off on the flat part of the course. So Eddie Bowman's is doing well for a, a young rider this year. We're backed up with the leader. And those two Panasonic riders will probably be at least nine minutes down. And uh, at the top of that uh, mountain, we'd cover 55 uh, kilometres. So it's only about 35 miles of racing. And they've lost already nine minutes on uh, Chesholi here, who took that uh, time of the, uh, that climb of the Galibier. And this is the downhill bit. I think he's going to wait for that chasing group of looks, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, yes, he's... Uh, we were talking about this yesterday, just tr trying to get in the, the energy back, and uh, you can see he's got three back pockets there, uh, and he's got just a, a small amount of food in there just so he can keep eating, and later on when he comes up to the, the feed section, he'll take more in, in your bag, but certainly on the, the big climbs, he doesn't want to be uh, have his pockets full of food. <laughs> Well, the food station is at uh, saint jean de Morien, and that will be after 103 kilometres have been covered. It's pretty all downhill now, so they can munch away on the descent. Just look at that wonderful, wonderful sight. Absolutely magnificent uh, to come up here to watch the race and to soak in the beauty of the Alps, the crags up there, the snow still there. It never, ever goes away from the top because it's just sheltered from the uh, rays of the sun at its, uh, at its hardest, and it's very much, uh, very solid inside. And here, this group, Miller, still sitting on the back, having... Uh, recovered from that uh, crash that we saw. We wish them luck on the way down. Uh, Inika Gaston, uh, as uh, yesterday, had a, a pretty bad crash, and we've now caught Whoop. a fly. <laughs> What's one less? Now you can see sometimes why these riders either wear the goggles on the descent or put the little cap in front of their eyes to, to stop the insects from flying in them. Nothing worse than an insect in your eyes. I've had that in the past. And even worse, you've got your mouth open, collecting one in the back of the throat. Just, uh, just looking at the riders here, you can see them descending very quickly. and. The, the technology of the bikes these days, I mean, they, they certainly don't have the uh, high-tech ABS-style braking that the cars do, but the brakes that they've got now are very strong, and they're braking here basically with the front brake. Um, and I'm, I'm sure if something uh, more urgent came up and they really had to stop quickly, they'd be using the back brake as well, but tending not to use the back brake so much um, just in case they lock that back wheel. And especially on a descent like this, you never know when there's going to be melting snow and there, there can be often times you can come around a corner and there'll be water across the road. And that's a, that's a fatal thing to be uh, locking your brakes on, on the water. And 
and that's uh, and that's that, that's why the the riders are tending to use their front brake and just to be a bit careful here. <laughs> the, the fly was proving very difficult to, to move off. The uh, cameraman, by the way, has got headphones, so he can hear his director speaking to him. And I should imagine that he's never before been asked to, "Will you cle please keep the, get the fly off your lens?" Uh, it's got, what you, we can see, or you can see it at home on your television sets, larger than life. But I tell you, the little uh, eyepiece that the camera is looking through is about the size of a matchbox. He's just got it. And it's in black and white, by the way. They, they don't. Some cameras can have colour, but now normally they're looking black and white. The actual view uh, eyepiece he's looking through is no more than about the size of a matchbox. And he's got to pick up the picture. He's got to zoom in. Uh, let his either his zoom lens pick it up that he wants, or he's got to hold it back to get the exact uh, shot he wants, so it's nice and clear for you at home to watch it. And these cameramen are absolute experts. I know that um, uh, a lot of my friends in other sports say that the, the French cameraman, particularly, the only thing they're good at, or the best thing they're good at, is is covering the Tour de France, uh, and when you get to things like rugby and so on, they don't quite get the same angles and the same in-depth coverage as perhaps other cameramen do, but when it comes to Tour de France, they're unbeatable. And there, Robert Miller getting rid of a bottle. I was looking back uh, uh, at the report in 1986 of the, uh, the stage from Briançon to Lap d'Huez, 162 kilometres, when uh, Hino and Le Monde were battling out for the yellow jersey. That was one when they finished up the Alpe d'Huez, and when uh, Le Monde and uh, uh, Hino came over the line, together virtually in first place and say here's uh, Bruno say come on through and Felix Levitin, who was then the uh, race director, said uh, as they came down off the Galibier, they did exactly the same thing down his 30-kilometre descent, that uh, uh, the way that Hino and Le Mans, both of them, were just riding each other into the ground, they both belonged to the same team, but the battle was on between the young upstart Le Mans and the, the uh, man Hino to try and get that yellow jersey, and they said they were going down at 90 kilometres an hour, locked in combat all the way down, having their own private little battle really at just this little speed. group of about half a dozen men put in the rain, uh, together with uh, our 17th of the hairpins, by the way, if you want to know what the little zigzag sign is up on the top left-hand side of your screen, that is the number of zigzags towards the top, the uh, gap between them and the leaders is 3 minutes and 27 seconds, Kipuchi is uh, pushing hard uh, to try and catch up there, but he must be awfully tired after that phenomenal ride that he did yesterday, when he spent something like 155 miles in the lead, either with a group of 10 or on his own. I think he's saying a few choice words to his Italian friend here, uh, coming along, and it must be, I suppose, it's sometimes been encouragement, but sometimes occasionally, I don't think he's really enjoying it, is he? No, I, don't, I, I think at that point, um, the, the spectators uh, become a bit of a p uh, pest to the riders. I mean, uh, no sport survives without spectators and fanatics, but uh, certainly yesterday we saw a very dangerous situation where the, the spectators actually blocked the road, and. I, re I really hope that the, the French police can control the roads today better than the Italian police did yesterday. And, of course, earlier on, on the climb of the Col de Galibier, uh, uh, the touch of wheels, or they, we think a spectator might have, have come out and caused the wheels to touch. Bunyo went down uh, together with Miller. They weren't badly hurt. It was just within about 100 metres of the top, but that was also put down to spectators stepping out and getting in the way. Well, that was unconfirmed, that report. We certainly saw them come down. Uh, and uh, this group then beginning to accelerate on the climb. Tunis is still there. Hey, he's fought back. So I thought we got rid of I thought we were down to just uh, five men, but no, two, four, six of them there. Yeah, that's Berenk there yeah. with his jacket wide open. I think Claveriolo's got his name uh, well and truly uh, plastered on the wall there. Somebody's been busy with the whitewash. Yes, his, his home's not so far from there. He lives about 75, 80 kilometres from, from Mount Duez. So I'm sure a lot of the locals will be there painting his name on the road. And uh, all these five are still sitting together very well indeed. And their Moto One shows you that that is the leading group and they've unzipped the... Uh, the shirts except Hamston, who looks uh, nice and cool and calm with uh, most of his zip done up. Uh, Franco Vona alongside him, two stage victories in the uh, Tour of Italy this year. And uh, Boyo, winner of a stage in the uh, Tour of Switzerland. And Montoya at the back, second overall in the Tour of uh, Spain. And young Jan Nevens in there, already a stage winner in the, in the Tour this year. We're back with the giants of the road then, still this little group of six men. 
under pressure from Claudio Kipucci, but I don't know what's going to happen to Tunisia. He's surely got to drive this a bit faster. I mean, Kipucci's going well. They, they're dropping people off the back, but he doesn't seem to be quite fast enough at the moment to make Clayton to pull back that uh, leading group. And it's a long way to go up this, this climb of uh, something like about, what, 12, 13 uh, kilometres, of which 10 is very, very tough indeed. Yeah. It's quite obvious that this group here is is going quicker than the front group, but that time gap is uh, certainly certainly too big to, to bridge. And all the, I mean, realistically, G, Giapucci and Induran, they they're going for the time. The other guys, Tennis, he's he's the best he can hope for, sixth place. So he's just sitting there and waiting, waiting for the finish. And Richard Rank, there you can see he's. He uh, rode strong yesterday for the early part, and he he's, he started this morning very hard as well. So uh, he's having a very good tour de France. I mean, he's uh, 21 years of age and uh, second year professional. So he's he's really uh, he's he's carried the the yellow jersey, the the polka dot jersey, uh, the polka dot jersey that you see here worn now by the Giapucci, signifying the king of the mountains. Um, which is the accumulation of points every day and each each climb is categorized as to the difficulty and the amount of points um, allocated towards that but uh, you see here Montoyo now he's dropping off um, and that's quite interesting because uh, you can see he's not panicking he's you don't I don't know whether he's been dropped or he's just got a maybe he's slipped a gear or they, they're sudden. They're, they're not sort of uh, surging yet. They've got. We can see now the 10-kilometer mark to go, and this is where the climb really starts to get hard. Um, you see Hamston and Bona riding side by side, which is an indication that they're riding, still riding steady. You see uh, Boyer there, the, the Z rider. He he looks extremely comfortable, and uh, I don't like making predictions. And I'm. <laughs> Usually when I do, I'm wrong, but uh, I, I like his style of riding. He's extremely aggressive, and if he's got the, the energy left at the finish, Boyer will really attack, and he'll attack hard. Well, we've seen riders on this climb in the past uh, blow suddenly. As I said that uh, Miller in... Uh in this climate four he's had all sorts of problems in the past he knows what it's like he's further down the hill now and uh, and last year lino said he lost 10 minutes from the foot of the uh, the climb uh, on the leaders that he had been with before so still three minutes 17 seconds they've got a lot of work to do to catch up with them and uh, miller way back in 1989 on this particular climb lost three minutes uh, on the climb and he didn't get shelled out until they were about halfway up it so let's uh, keep our fingers crossed for those riders up in the lead at the moment and this is the chase group who now realize that unless they accelerate they certainly said bye-bye to chance of winning the stage there are points of course in the king of the mountains and there'll be a lot of prize money going down in the king of the mountains for the different places overall tunisia arriving here will want to accelerate and move further up. now you can see the motorcycles up in front uh, beginning to go up i think these riders are sensing perhaps they might be closing the gap down and certainly we'll wait for the next time check it has been coming down bit by bit uh, and the further up you go i think it's gonzalez my mistake uh, uh, on the uh, on the class rider uh, I thought earlier on that uh, the one we got in there was Espinosa. It is, in fact, uh, uh, Arsenio Gonzalez, who uh, went away yesterday. So there we are. And uh, the rider on the back, Varenk, earlier holder of the polka dot jersey in the Kingdom Management. We're down in Spain, still hanging on to this group, uh, searching after the leading uh, five. We're up with the leading group uh, of uh, the climb up the Alp d'Huez. The rider being dropped off this one, Montoya. We're down to four men. Montoya's out of it uh, right now. Good climb, but he's had enough of this one. Still Hampson looking remarkably comfortable on the front. Uh, Jan Navens, perhaps not the uh, the climber of the, of the same stature of the rest of the riders in this little group, is in fact uh, sitting at the back, as I'd expect him to do, leaving uh, Franco Vona, who did a great ride up uh, Siestra yesterday to take a second place on the climb, and these are the riders who are chasing after them. Uh, that's the 10 kilometer go point board. Well, that's um, still going to take them something around about to 15 minutes, I suppose, toward the top of this climb. They're well ahead of the expected uh, average speed on this stage yet again. 
Tunisia moving through. Do you think he's going to have a go at this one, or has he got to sit there and say, that's it, I'm in for uh, sixth place? Right, you're trying to draw me into a prediction <laughs> here, David. But, um, I mean, the, the other riders around him, they've all proved that they've been going well in the mountains. Tunis, we know in other years that he's gone well, and and certainly uh, we we thought today that, that he, uh, he'd be going for the up to air stage, but we don't know until it really happens, do we? No, we don't, and the team cars behind... By the way, normally they run in order. In fact, they always do until they come forward for that reason. They run in order of the riders on general classification. So the first team car behind this little group will be that of Miguel Indoran for Bonesto. The next car will be that of Career. You saw it come up then for uh, Claudio Chiapucci, who's lying second on general classification. And the third team car in line will be that of Gianni Bugno for the, uh, uh, the Gatorade team. And that's the way they have the pecking order, which means that the best place riders can get very quickly serviced or their managers can get up very quickly uh, to talk to them. And uh, here then, just those four men still uh, out there, and this is the chasing group. We see the, the team cars all day. Uh, this is the Tour de France is the only race in the world where you're compelled to use the sponsor's brand of car. Uh, normally, the, every every team has different different sorts of car and has their own stickers all over the car. But for the Tour de France, they're supplied with the with these particular model of car by the sponsor, and and it means changing, and putting their own stickers on the car, setting it up, setting the roof racks up, and and there's quite a lot of organisation that goes into setting up a team car because there's. Uh, the, the, the seats and you've got to take the, the headrests out so you can see and you've got to be able to jump out of the car quickly so it involves quite a deal of setting up all these the cars that we see here. Well, years gone by, I remember they used to have the doors off the cars. Um, uh, the, the supplier then used to take both doors off and they used to have uh, like a, a, a canvas side to them so that they could get in and out quite easily, but they don't bother to do that now in this day and age. Of course, I think that many of the uh, cars with sunshine roofs, they stand and look out the top and can see what's going on and they can very quickly uh, leap out when necessary. Because the trouble with opening doors is that riders and motorcycles can bang into them, but certainly the old canvas doors were something used for, for a long, long time. Well, like we were talking about yesterday in the the latter part of the stage when we, we were talking about opening the doors to keep the spectators back wouldn't be such a bad idea um, <laughs> yesterday just to, to use the doors as a, uh, a bulldozer. Uh, well, another bottle gone down as a souvenir and uh, so Gonzalez on the front, Tunisia behind, the yellow jersey at Miguel Indoran, just behind in the polka dot jersey of uh, Claudio Chiapucci. Chiacchioli in there as well for the GB, MG boys, and the RMO ride at the back. Uh, Varank doing the right thing, I think, in watching them up in front do the work and just sensibly following the wheels of men who've got a lot more experience than he's got at this sort of thing. Up in front, you can see the motorcycle, the man saying, go forward, go forward. He's trying to urge the, uh, the traffic on because they begin to catch up to some of the motor cars in front. We might have a bit of a traffic jam, and whoever's up there, they're trying to get them out of the way. You see the baton going, the commissaire has gone forward to urge those vehicles on. Furious screaming going on over the race radios because we say these, these team cars are not the normal ones that they have. They have to put their own radios in, their special frequencies, race radio frequencies. And many of the team managers also transfer their horns across, don't they? Because they all seem to have their different tone to play. Yes. Um, also, too, on the flatter stages, uh, you see the, the heavier type helmets. They've got radio built, radio uh, tr uh, receivers built into them now, so uh, one or two riders in the team can ride along with the earphone in and uh, get tactics on the move from the team without having to go back to the team car. Oh, nice move there. Hampton then sharing a drink uh, with uh, Franco Vono, and behind uh, it's Boyer's turn. Just these three then. They've, they've shelled out uh, Navens, they've shelled off Montoya, and uh, the rider there, whoops, run faster, little lad. <laughs> He's done it. Oh, oh. oh, that's made his day. <laughs> <laughs> He'll go back and tell his schoolmates. He actually handed up a, a, a bottle of water to uh, Eric Boye. Well, these three sharing the pace. They know they've got to share at the moment because this group behind, wetting away, but still uh, around about three minutes. is just inside the three at one of the latest time checks we've got coming in. What a race we've got going up this climb. These three, uh, these three riders up in up in the front group now. They they realise uh, that the time will be whittled down, and it doesn't matter whether the the time gap's only five seconds at the end. The main thing is that they aren't caught 
for the uh, the sprint for the line because if they are caught, it means that uh, most probably the riders here in Duran uh, and Bunyo will sprint past them. So it's uh, it's in their best interest. We see Boyer going just off the back there. Well, and uh, if you just tuned in, let me tell you also the sad news of the day is that Greg LeMond has abandoned the race today. He was off the back at the very first hill of the day up the uh, de Montenevre. So LeMond decided after they went over the top of the Galibier when he was something like about 18 minutes down that enough was enough and he has retired from the race. What a war of attrition we've got yet again because yesterday 14 men abandoned on the race. Uh, others were taken out because they were outside the time limit. The same thing will happen today. There will be a time limit on the race. Depending on the winner's time, a percentage will be applied. And there are a lot of very, very tired riders when suddenly the elastic snaps and off the back you go. We'll be happy to get to the Alpes today, but many of them will be packing their bags and on their way home because they're going to finish outside the time limit. This morning we started with 148 riders or so in the race, and there's going to be a lot less than that will be on the road tomorrow. The damage is being done today by the consistent riding of this group. You're looking at now with only Andy Hampson left in there uh, uh, with uh, Franco Fono with any chance of winning this stage. The gap though 255 it was at the bottom of the valley uh, something in the order of 3 minutes and 27 seconds so it's coming down all the time and Andy Hampson searching for a stage victory today in the tour he hasn't done that for some time now and uh, has he got it in his legs as he's got rid of Franco Fono who finished second yesterday. Fono came back in a remarkable way yesterday he suddenly recovered towards the end when uh, Indurain had gone past him and came back past Indurain. And now up in front, uh, Hampson heading away, looking for a victory in this year's Tour de France. But still a long way off the top of this, uh, this very tortuous road up towards the summit of the Alpes d'Huez. A race that's seen enormous competition in the past. And look at this crowd. We see uh, Hampson, he hasn't actually attacked uh, Vona, but he's just kept the pace so high. Vona's kept going and going. His heart rate's got to a limit where he's just, he knows that he can't go at that pace, so he's backed off. He's not going to leave himself in a position where he explodes and he's just totally shattered and left on the road. He's just backed off. He knows he's got to just settle in and ride at his own pace to the finish line. And uh, this is a chasing group. Uh, we're still... The yellow jersey there, and still the yellow and blue and red jersey of uh, Tunisia there. And they're all one by ones. Well, this means the, the concerted effort of that little leading group has now disappeared under the pressure of Hampson, who is still looking very, very good indeed. Riding a bike by the made by Eddie Merckx, who was five times winner of the Tour de France, and now is in the bicycle manufacturing business. So I'm sure the old Eddie will be pleased with uh, young Hampson's performance today. Well, oftentimes when you look in the results of the, the paper at the cycling, you see MT or uh, ST, same time. Today, it's definitely not going to be the same time for many of the riders. It, it's going to be staggered and it's going to look more like a, a finish of a time trial. Yeah, it's going to be good goodbye for some of them, I think, isn't it, too? As the, uh, the speed of this back group is, is quite uh, formidable, and I think they're accelerating and certainly the gap is still coming down. Those mad spectators, I, I know that uh, some would like to get in, in the act of it all, but I can't comprehend why anybody, except one running all the way up there, what is he trying to do, except, as we said the other day, when the fat fellow went, have a, a mobile heart attack? God dear me. Well, Frank's hanging on in there. That's a nice little move on his part, doing the right thing, isn't he? He's chipping away, and uh, he's Rich is one of those, he's a real character. He'll, he'll just stay there and do what he can. Well, Kipuchi at the front. You can see now Kipuchi's just really turning, turning up the pace. Uh, even as he takes a drink, he's still pedaling and keeping the force on the pedals. And we're back up then with uh, Andy Hampson, the American. This is a really nice ride by Andy. He, um, he's one of the, the, the super friendly guys in the bunch. He's always, he's not a big head and he'll, he'll talk to anyone. He, Today he's, uh, he's really put it in the legs and he's riding just so smoothly. He's just been working away, working away all day. He hasn't had to have any uh, super aggressive attacks. He's just kept the pressure on and, and whittled the, the, the small group down and now he's by himself for the what looks like a, a stage victory. 
Well, 29 years of age and uh, five foot nine, weighing 140 pounds. So that's 10 stone in uh, in the UK. So 10 stone is quite light for a man who's five foot nine, but it just shows his long uh, limbs as well. He's uh, quite slim, but uh, got a lot of power in there too. There's a Motorola car going up to have a word with him as Franco Vona is left to lone ride in second spot. So Hampson then from Boulder, Colorado, the 29-year-old just up the front of the screen. In fact, he turned 30 on April the 7th, so perhaps a little birthday present or late might hear for him as he's still three minutes, seven seconds, because that was coming down inside three minutes. He's accelerating away again. That's good, isn't it? Dead Bernardino at the back, uh, another man who's uh, fought his way up this top of the climb of the uh, Alp Duez in the past, and uh, he had a tremendous success in 86 when he went up with uh, uh, Greg LeMond when LeMond was in the yellow jersey, tried to get rid of uh, LeMond, failed to do it, and Greg took one of his uh, three uh, successes on uh, the Tour de France, three yellow jerseys, but Greg is out of the race. And another American here that uh, has always been there or thereabouts is Andy Hampston. You can see uh, you can see Henny Kuiper there, just a, a quick flash, and I'm sure uh, himself being a, a great rider and knowing the problems that occurred yesterday, um, the, the directors would be very, very careful that the same thing didn't happen again. And, and Henny, I'm sure, would be as close to behind Andy or behind this motorbike that we're seeing the view with, with the camera at the moment, as close as possible to stop all these crazy spectators. And I'm sure that they'll be moving back a lot quicker knowing that a car's going to hit them if they um, try and get in the way like they did yesterday. Well, I don't think, in fact, that Andy Hampson has ever won a stage in the Tour de France. He's had thirds and he's had fifths, and he's uh, he's been uh, in fourth place overall. He's taken the, the, the white jersey as the best young rider in the Tour, but I certainly don't think that Andy's actually won a stage in the Tour de France before. He's won stages in many other major road races, um, stage races, but he certainly, to my knowledge, hasn't uh, had a stage in the uh, in the Tour de France. He's had one, certainly, in the uh, Tour of Switzerland. He's had a couple of stage wins in the Tour of Italy when he won that one overall as well. Uh, so Andy, if you hang on to this one, is going to create a bit of history as far as he's concerned. And some publicity of Motorola who've been searching for a stage victory this year. Uh, normally we would have expected Barr or Anderson to perform on the flat and search for them. But uh, with 21 stages and 22 teams in the race, everybody tries to get a stage victory. And it looks like he might be on the way to doing just that now because the gap's still hovering around about three minutes. I would have liked to hear the team talk of the Motorola camp last night. I mean, we mentioned that it's been a fairly quiet tour up until yesterday for the Motorola team. And uh, today, I mean, it's, it's you quickly eat your words when you realise what, uh, what what Andy Hampson has done today. I mean, he's, he's had such a good ride and he's just he's been with the brake the whole day and, and now he's here. And he's just settled. You notice he's settled into a nice rhythm. He's up on the bars. He's relaxed. He, he realises that he's going for the win and he's really driven, although he's tired, he's driven by the fact that he's, he's going to get the stage victory. And his uh, top here soaked in sweat and water from the, uh, the, the, the effort and climbing this hill. They're reeling him in one by one, Montoya now being pulled in. All that long work, that hard uh, effort to stay away, and he has now got to give uh, best to this very fast-moving group. I don't even think he's got the strength to get on the back, has he? Is he going to try? No, he's still going at his own speed. Well, disappointment then. I mean, second in the Tour of Spain when we all thought he was going to win it, just couldn't time trial well, and that uh, went to uh, Tony Rominger who uh, frightened a few people because Tony was never looked upon as being a man who could win a major tour. Always the shorter ones, the early part of the season, because he suffered with uh, hay fever and, and uh, troubles with the pollen. Well, he won that one. Montoya out of that one. He's out of winning a stage today. And this group's still working away, one by one, picking off the early escapers. Well, they've stuck together so far. They haven't split, have they, this little lot? And Kierputti's doing most of the work at the front still. I'd have yeah. thought, presuming, I mean, going on to his, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning it. Perhaps he hasn't got any more strength at the moment. He's not driving that bit faster, is he? I mean, perhaps it's, 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 it's very much this brinkmanship they do, expecting someone to crack up in front. Well, it, maybe, maybe also uh, David has been sensible and realising that if he does attack, uh, G. Pucci and both Induran and G. Pucci could join him and counter attack him. Yeah. And if, if that happened, he might not have the energy to go with him. So. Obviously, he's a, a smart rider and he, he knows 
his own capabilities and, and really he could be just waiting till a bit later. Yeah, he's, he's always there, isn't he? Look, he's just moving up alongside the shoulder of Chick Cole, you know, and, and uh, he's, he's getting a bit further near to the front, just progressively moving up, not jumping around, and sitting there solid at rock as uh, Kipuchi has to miss yet another spectator uh, standing out in their way. He is, isn't he? Look, look, he's just getting that Tunisia in the yellow, just moving up towards the front. And this is the man they're chasing down. So on his own at the moment, Andy Hampson going towards what might be his first stage victory in the Tour de France. The rider who took the white jersey for the best under 24 rider way back in 1986 when he finished fourth in the Tour. And here he is now with four kilometres from the top. And it flattens just a little bit here, but you can see in the distance uh, the ski village of the Alpe d'Huez is just up there. If the cameras go up on the right-hand side, massive number of people have been up waiting. Yes? There you go. You see the graceful limb that you were talking about before. He's just got two punches in on two people. Um, he's, he's definitely not in the mood to have people pouring water over him. He can't afford to be having cold water poured over his body. I mean, his body temperature's way up now, and his resistance would be very low, and he can't afford to be getting sick just uh, through the over-enthusiasm of some spectator. Well, with four kilometres to go, Andy Hampson now a lead of some three minutes and 32 seconds. Surely, barring some sort of accident, that must be enough to get this Motorola uh, rider his first victory of the, uh, of the Tour, uh, as this little group here are just going under the five kilometre, so they are a whole kilometre behind uh, Andy Hampson. Uh, the crowd here welling out onto the... Uh, pathway in front of these riders still struggling up in front are the early riders that have been uh, seen off because early on we saw Montoya pull back uh, Boyer, Hampston, Vono, Nevins were all in that early break we've not been seeing where the rest of they've gone so let's see off a helicopter who's surviving between Hampston that's Hampston we've gone straight up to we're looking at about eight to ten minutes uh, of the, this main group uh, the, the, the second group that we see uh, until the finish. Well, the gentleman carrying the uh, stars and stripes, I think that President Bush will send him a message of congratulations, happy wearing a Swiss national champion's jersey. So I suppose that, that's a multitude of sins because, of course, anyway, uh, Andy Hampson, best known as a Tour of Switzerland uh, rider because he uh, won that in 87. He had uh, a third place in... Uh, 1990 and the third place in 1991. He's very much a Tour de Switzerland rider. And here we have this little group. No, is still slotted back into third, so perhaps you're right. He might well have said, that's it. I've just got to ride and get the best place I can out of this little group. Oops, that's it. So... Having got the special premium prize this morning up the uh, climb of the Col de Galibier, we're now seeing, I think, the last of the effort for today as far as uh, Ciccioli is concerned. He picked up uh, 20,000 French francs, that's about £2,000 for his performance on the Souvenir de Grands up the Galibier, but he's drifting off the pace now. And still, uh, young uh, Vranc is here hanging on. Uh, and up in front, it looks like the yellow jersey is beginning to put the pressure on uh, Kirpochi. Oh, nonchalantly almost there, the way that Indrain looked back to see if Kipuchi is all right when that spectator got in the way. And the first prize at the top, 5,000 uh, francs, that's 500 quid. Just imagine that, going all the way up here to, to earn 500 pounds. <laughs> if, you, if you paid people 5,000 pounds, so wouldn't want to ride up this hill alone, let alone ride all the way to get here. The distance they've covered, uh, 186 kilometres by the time they get to the top of this climb. And the massive crowd here cheering Andy Hampson on his way up. Just parting enough for him to see. They have to get their photos on the old television, just getting in the way of the rider too. It uh, is appalling, really. Franco Vono, who was with that group. There we are. Now then, uh, that's 3.40, say 3.38, actually. A bit late getting the camera up into the other. Uh, they're saying 32 seconds back to Vono from Hampson. Three, uh, 30 can, something then. We can see mm. Gert Jan losing contact with the group there. He's uh, finally blown, and, and we can see Varank go past him, and he's looking around to see if he's caught back up. And Varank's just trying to stay in contact with the group too now. So 
So the answer to that question then is whether Tunis was saving himself an onslaught in the last five kilometres. The answer no. He's uh, sold out at this point and just showing the strength of the yellow jersey here. This is our last big day in the mountains, by the way. Uh, and Indrain doing what he has to do on general classification at the moment. Claudio Kipucci is 1 minute 42 seconds down. He's got to keep an eye on Claudio Kipucci. He's done it all the way up here. Kipucci's riding on his wheel. Uh, Gianni Bugno is further down the slope this morning, 4.20 down on classification. Lino also further down the slope at 7 minutes 21. So this is a day, I think, in game when Indrain has, in, has forced his majestic uh, power upon this race. And young Andy Hampson in front, I'll say young 30-year-old Andy Hampson in front, now for Motorola, he's riding to what I think is his first ever stage victory in the Tour de France. How the hell you can decide where to go to that massive crowd, I don't know. And Vono is drifting off the pace, he's about 40-odd seconds down. Rank now is having uh, some problems in hanging on to the pressure that Indurain is putting all his nearest uh, uh, competitors under. And Indurain is doing what he, he does best of all, that's relentlessly driving, riding, 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 and riding people off his wheel. So this must be the day when he shows that he is the winner of the yellow jersey and that with the come the time trial uh, that he'll he'll dominate that yet again but as my producer Annette said to me some years ago when Fignon was 50 seconds up on Le Mans in the final time trial don't throw it away anything can happen they've not finished yet and how right she was because Le Mans won by eight seconds so Indurain then in terms of strength ability courage and uh, an understanding of what the Tour de France is all about is certainly the man in the yellow jersey who should win this one but you never know until we get to the finish there's another week yet to go we wish him no ill at all but riders can suffer from all sorts of problems and at the moment though he doesn't seem to be suffering it's the rest of the riders in the Tour de France that are suffering under the pressure that, that uh, Indoran has applied ever since he took the yellow jersey at the end of that uh, time trial stage and now there's only two of them left to chase after Franco Vono in front and Andy Hampston uh, they're up there in front of them on the hill just those two riders I don't know what's happened to Boyer obviously has he got caught uh, uh, Clayton I haven't seen Boyer come back either. But no. Hampson went away, Werner was next, Boyer was the other one in there. We saw Nevins drop off, we saw Montoya drop off, and here's Franco Werner rocking away. We've got him down as second on the road at the moment, but where the heck is Boyer? We shall see when we get to the top, and uh, what it's, a welcome uh, sight, eh? Two, two kilometres to go. Uh, the, normally, the, the Flamme Rouge, the, the last kilometre, that's when the riders really get motivated, and, and I know for myself that's uh, once you're in the final kilometre, you, you really get that surge. And on the Alpe d'Huez, there is a little bit of a false flat, actually, uh, between the, uh, uh, first, uh, the one kilometre and the finish. It flattens and goes up again. It just kicks at them. But um, here, they're still one kilometre behind. So whatever it takes them to do that one, Andy Hampson has gone under the two. They're just under the three. And the gap then, 3.32, it's been, uh, it was 3.10, then 3.1, then 3.32. It's been yo-yoing a bit. It may well come down still as we get close to the top, but I can't see him pulling back three minutes in these uh, final uh, three kilometres with Hampson now just two to do. Well, we saw Hampson yesterday in, in the break, and uh, today he's been rewarded for his efforts. He, he got in the break early, and he's probably with slightly lesser riders today, but he, he persisted and and it was a more or less a, a process of elimination and here he is by himself and he's really he's really going for the line now. You can see he's, he's really pedaling. Well, Franco Verna was uh, 51 seconds down on uh, Hampson as uh, he went underneath that uh, banner at two kilometres to go. The Basques are here, the, the flags, uh, Belgium are here. I've seen even a Union Jack painted on the side, on the road as well. So Miller will get a big uh, applause when he comes up. He's certainly in the top 20 on the road further down, we heard, but to goodness knows what might be happening now. So everybody here will have a wonderful sight, and they're waving the flags of different nations. See, the Basque flags are out, the Spanish flags are out. The flags of all nations are here for these riders who are taking part in this, the 1992 Tour de France. Next year, the 90th since this great race was first thought of way back in uh, uh, 1903. And every year we see epic battles. We've seen one this year. And looks like history being made again for Andy Hampson as they go around these 21 hairpin bends relentlessly riding up towards the top of this, the final hard, uh, tough mountain stage in the Tour de France. Tomorrow then, the, the uh, 15th stage of the race. We'll be just taking in uh, uh, 
two third cats and one second category climb on the way into uh, Saint-Étienne. The next day on the 16th stage, there's just uh, a couple of second category climbs and one third category climb as Hampson now works towards the one kilometre to go. He looks like he's got this one in the bag. Then uh, from uh, the 17th stage, a couple of, well, there's only four fourth category climbs, so the Claudio Chiapucci in the polka dot jersey uh, looks like he's got that one well and truly stitched up because he's going to finish in the top for four, three or four places here. We know Fra uh, Vono is between Hampson and these two. We haven't seen what's happened to Boyer at the moment, but we'll find out when they get up towards the uh, finishing line. I press the uh, watch at the two kilometre to go uh, banner, but we've gone back and now picked up uh, Vono, who might yet still hang on to that uh, second place. So that second place, two days on the trot for the man who took uh, two stage victories in the uh, Tour of Italy and finished in that race uh, in sixth place overall. One down on Hampson, who was fifth in the uh, uh, Giro d'Italia. So Hampson showing remarkable strength, as Indran is doing, to ride both in the Tour of Italy and in the, uh, in the Tour of France. No sign yet of Boya, is there? No, um, I think we've lost him. Lost in the crowd, maybe. What do you think of this crowd? Eh? Magnificent, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good crowd. It's good for the good for the sport, and I mean, even with the, the tremendous coverage on Eurosport and um, and the radio, and I mean, the the modern technology enables you to, to sit at home and watch. I mean, it hasn't lessened the the strength of the crowd and the, the numbers over the years either, which is a good thing for cycling. And even a Japanese flag hanging out there. Many of the riders, of course, on Japanese equipment, once dominated over the years by the Italians and the French. But still, it's an international component supplies, international bike riders. Here, we're seeing an American riding a bicycle made in Belgium with uh, Japanese parts upon it. And uh, what an international race we've got yet again. And a victor then goes, victory to an American, Andy Hampson. I'm pretty certain that's the first ever victory Andy's had in the, the uh, Tour de France. He'll be elated with that one. And Franco Vono hanging on for his uh, second uh, second place of the tour. If he can just hang on in there that little bit, just all the way. Look at that, 32.7 kilometres per hour. That's again a stage in excess of 20 miles an hour under very, very tough conditions. The temperature in the 30 degrees centigrade. The riders, having been in the saddle yesterday for 7 hours and 44 minutes was a winner's time. And some of the competitors coming in over 50 minutes down on the leader yesterday. They've had some very, very tough uh, rides in the Tour de France this year. And the Alpe d'Huez has seen now this, the uh, 18th finish of the Tour up here at the Alpe d'Huez. Last year and the year before, it's Bunya that won it. This year we've got an American. Looking back down the list, we've never seen an American win it before in the Alpe d'Huez. Uh, so even in the days when uh, Le Mans was trying hard, he didn't quite get it. So he allowed, of course, Hino to win way back in uh, 86, push, pushed him over the line because uh, Le Mans had kept the yellow jersey. So it's been a battleground for stage success. It's been battleground for the yellow jersey. And the yellow jersey once again has shown consistently today, aided and betted by the Bonesto team. As Franco Vono now just about makes it in. And yes, there we are. There is Boyer. We thought he was still on his bike. So... Um, he is in uh, third spot at the moment, so Zed have got something to show for a day which have got disappointment because uh, Greg LeMond, their Zed uh, team leader, is out of the tour, having uh, failed to stay the pace again today. Yesterday he came in 49 minutes down, uh, Greg, on the leader. He tried to start today, one of his teammates waited for him, but in the end it was no good at all as he got further and further behind, and after the Galibier we knew enough was enough. But nevertheless, Zed today have got something to show for their team in the Tour de France a third place then for Eric Boyer to go with the stage he got in the Tour of Switzerland which is one of those races that they have early in the season as a sort of a testing ground for the Tour de France two minutes and eight seconds down well we've probably got just uh, less than a minute to wait for these two to come in in the yellow jersey, triumphantly, Miguel Indoran from Spain. The Italian there, the little fellow behind him in the polka dot jersey of the King of the Mountains. Claudio Capucci yet again taking that uh, polka dot jersey in towards uh, the finish in uh, France, uh, in, in Paris. Claudio is second overall in general class. In fact, Nevins is still there. I thought he got blown out further down. Well, my apologies to young Jan Nevins. That's a superb ride, isn't it, Dave? Yes, Eve, uh, it's, it's good to see that the riders that were in the break have uh, struggled to, to stay in the front. 
and uh, and been rewarded with their efforts. I mean, to, to go so early, and it would have been a shame if they were swallowed up by by these riders well, or Mon even the main group. Well, Montoya was. He was caught actually. There were there were some uh, what two, four, five men away. So certainly Hampston, then uh, Bono, then Boyer have managed to get first, second, and third. And here we come up, having got Navens into fourth place, fifth and sixth as Kerpucci searches for an extra point in the uh, King of the Mountains competition. He's got that one stitched up now. He'll be able to ride the rest of the race and keep out of trouble and keep that jersey through to the finish. He's still in second place uh, behind the yellow jersey of Miguel Indoran as a fresco, absolutely mad. Everybody trying to get uh, uh, a comment from the uh, man in the yellow and the man in the polka dot. We'll see him up on the rostrum later on. As uh, Frank, that's a great ride today for him, isn't it? Yes, that's, uh, that's a really pleasing ride for Richard. He's another young rider too, isn't he? Yes, he, uh, he he's such a character. I, I just laugh when I see him. He, I mean, he's such a, a good guy to be with, and he's a, he's one of my favourites to be when we share. There's a, we only ever have two riders to a room, and he's one of my favourites to be with because he's always got a smile on his face. <laughs> he's wrapped. You can see he throws his hand up like he's won the stage. Four minutes, three seconds yeah. down, but still, it's a great ride for him today to be up there. Uh, and Gerd Antonisa, previous stage victor in the Alp d'Huez, just uh, couldn't hold the pace when the pressure came on with Indurain and Kipuchi at the front. Let's see who else we've got, we've got coming in further down. Uh, Gonzalez was there, but it uh, looks like... Uh, breaking. Breaking, yes, yeah, yeah. so he's fought his way up. It's amazing how it changes on the lower reaches as one or two of the riders struggle. Breaking was always there or thereabouts in the main group along the Bord Cloison, and... Uh, He's come up, he's actually passed uh, Montoya because he was in that early leading group, but he's not with it at all. We see he's obviously fought back and uh, rode, rode quite strongly to finish so close to Giapucci and Indira. Yeah, and he's gone past Ciccoli, who was in that little group too, wasn't he? We see Lino there. Yeah. Le uh, Pascal, he's, he's sort of... Uh, when he went off the group, he, he realised, and we can see the, the RMO team car behind as well. And they, they'll be very happy with Pascal's ride today. He's showing that... Even though he's lost the jersey, he hasn't thrown in the towel, and he's he's fought on today, and and you can see he's he's really really tired now. So he came in five minutes ten seconds down on uh, Miguel Indurain, and uh, Ciccioli, who was also just outside the top 20, start this morning in 22nd place. That might move him up a little bit, I think, because he's certainly coming in ahead of people like uh, Raul Alcala and Francesca Morlon. Uh, so he could well move into the top 20. There is Montoya behind him, I think, who we saw further down. Certainly the Amaya rider in the distance, trying to stay the pace. And another one coming up as well. And that is Pedro Delgado coming up very quickly indeed. Of course, there are points towards the... Uh, well, they're actually tying towards the team award for today. Uh, that'll be the second of the Vanessa Rise. Actually sprinting at the moment, Delgado. Now that's one and two as far as uh, Benesto are concerned. We've only had one of the career riders over yet. Uh, Perini was going well further back down the road. And in fact, here he comes now, Perini. And uh, so that'll be the second of the counters for the, the, the career team. Uh, Class have got two riders in so far. Uh, and Amaya have got two in as well. So the um, very complex team award I think we're going to find today. <laughs> Two from Telecom still sat together. It looks like uh, Bolts there has just, just yep. uh, pushed the ARST rider out of the way, followed by Hetner, and there's uh, Robert Miller. That's yep. Yep. So it's interesting. We get two from TVM, two from Carrera, two from uh, um, from Benesto. We've got two from Class come up already as well. So it's going to be the third man in the team today that everyone's going to be anxiously waiting for to see who gets the team award today. Obviously, as far as Benesto is concerned, they've got two very well top place riders in Indrain and, uh, and Delgado. But um, who is going to be the third counter for the various teams? 32.7 miles at kilometers per hour. So Telecom will have two men up uh, as well. That's going to be <laughs> the judges <laughs> to get the old computer going to sort the team award out today. And a third point, uh, point, uh, counter for class as well. So I think they're probably the first team to finish three men.
You wouldn't think they've just written all that far when you were bouncing along, eh? You're fascinated, aren't you, by this? <laughs> the, the, the thing also that makes it difficult for the riders, you notice a lot of the, the, the front riders here, they're sprinting for the line, and they don't have any... They've built the lactic acid up in the legs, and they don't have any, any room or distance to, to warm down at all. They suddenly just stop, and they've got nowhere to move. And, and the man who stopped today, here he is, uh, Bunyo who uh, got dropped at one time. He was uh, really suffering up on the climb of the, uh, of, of the main climb of the day. We went up over the top of the Col de la Fer. One time on the Galibio, he'd um, been well and truly uh, up there in the lead earlier on, but he suffered for that. It looks like uh, Bunyo's going to drop out and be maybe fifth overall in general classification. Lino certainly finished ahead of him and will go ahead to Elgar this morning. He was fifth, so we're probably finding that, that uh, Pascal Lino will move up to probably uh, third place. Bunyo would like to drop down to fifth or sixth I thought he's really going to be in trouble uh, at the moment and uh, that would be disappointment for a man who's twice been a victor here as uh, Jim van der Leer for Tulip decides to have a hammer at the uh, at the rainbow jersey and give him uh, a bit of a, a rush for the finish and still uh, Rondon riding in for uh, Gatorade with his uh, team captain he's let him take the line so that's 9.02 I actually noted the time of Pascal Lino, so in fact, uh, Lino uh, uh, has got something like four minutes out of him then. There's uh, Bowman. Uh, Bowman. Yeah. So, yep. Yep. And uh, Nino, so in fact, uh, Lino has just pulled about another four minutes out of um, out of Bunyo. So certainly this morning when they started out, there was there was three minutes difference between them. So Lino has now gone over Bunyo. He could well be in third place. I'm not quite sure about uh, Delgado, where he came up uh, probably just that bit ahead of, um, of, of of Lino because there was one minute twenty seconds between the two. I didn't take uh, Delgado's time on the line, but probably Delgado could well have gone third and Lino fourth. He's that close at the moment, but Bunyo certainly has dropped out of the top three and will now. Be back there in, uh, in probably that sixth place. Well, they're still coming in here, and there's a lot of riders further down on the road as Espinosa for class comes on in. This massive crowd enjoying the sunshine. They've seen some great to rise today. Well, uh, thank you very much, David, uh, for allowing me to sit here for the last two days. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> well, uh, I've welcomed having you here too, Clayton. And uh, like Clayton, Stevenson and Duffield, it sounds like such fellow solicitors, but we've been commentating today for you on the Tour de France, covered by Eurosport. Another great day. We hope you'll join us tomorrow then for more racing. Do join us, please, on Eurosport. Bye-bye. <laughs> Malheureusement, le, le Canadien n'était pas au top et sur un tour aussi difficile que celui d'aujourd'hui.